Okay, well, let's get started. Um, I want to first introduce our guest speaker today, um, Ryan Jordan, UCLA men's head coach. Ryan, welcome. Um, Thanks for having me. Awesome. And, and we're going to have a little Q&A session today just to uh, see what uh, college perspective is on the upcoming recruiting classes and, and just some generic information that Ryan can provide for us. But uh, um, hopefully everybody enjoys the conversation we get to have today. All right. Um, anything you want to say to get started, Ryan, or should we hop right into no, it? No, thanks, thanks for having me on. It's always fun to, to have these dialogues. Obviously, we're in a, you know, we're in a challenging time right now, and it's, it's changed the landscape of some things, but uh, shouldn't be an inhibiting factor you know, for college processes for players, and you know, hopefully our dialogue can you know, flesh out some of that. Right. Cool. Well, let's, let's get started. The first question that I have for you is, what do you think players – should be doing to stay physically and technically active during this social distancing period? Because obviously this is, you know, it's an unprecedented time. Sure. Um, well, I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, this is a period of time right now where you find out who really loves the game and, and who really is interested because I think you, you talk to most players and most players these days, yeah, I want to go play in college or, you know, you hear it a lot you know, oh, I, want, I, I want to be a pro. Well, the reality to those things is that both things are very challenging. And so the work that a player has to do individually um, is well beyond just showing up at team training three times a week and playing right. a game on the weekend. And so th in this time period, we're really forced, um, I think players really have to make the decision on a daily basis con conscientiously to say, you know, what am I putting in here? And, and obviously most schools, the kids are working online um, and they're having to do the work from home. But in my estimation, they probably have a little bit more free time than they would have had otherwise. And so I think really it comes down to, you know, are you willing to go take your soccer ball and go find a wall and, and hit the ball against it a thousand times? Are you willing, depending upon what, you know, Arizona is allowing for with regards to small groups, you know, to get together and, and, and ping balls at one another, you know, with a social distance of appropriation, um, right. but be able to ping balls and, and continue to do work. And in reality, can you use this opportunity to continue to work on a fitness component? And, and certainly the older age groups, the ability to be, you know, working on strength and conditioning, working on a running progression, being able to do six days a week of work um, that's the hard work that makes good players. And it's not a sanitized, you know, American, you know, practice schedule of a couple days a week with your team uh, to excel. It's, it's doing the individual work. It's touching the ball. It's talking to your coach about, Hey, what are the things I need to work on specifically? I need to work on my change of direction. Great. I'm going to work on cutting the ball. I need to work on my dribbling and, and, and how I am in close contact. Well, I need to work on my passing and receiving and, and, Everybody can constantly work on the technical qualities and really it takes just you and a flat surface against you. And that can be on a playground with a, you know, a, a handball court. I mean, it, it can be on a field with a wall. I mean, it, it can take any shape of shapes and size, but it really comes down to how much do you want to go spend the time? No, I, I appreciate that. Cause I, look, I've been talking to my players as well and I keep telling them this time that you have to yourself, who's using it wisely. And yeah. you know, some kids, some players are, and some players aren't. And, you know, when we come out of this, I keep telling them, look, you need to be fit and ready to go because you don't want to risk injury of not having done anything. You also want to make sure you're on, you know, you can make the right teams and you are ready to go. And, and yep. this, this is what makes better players, right? And, and guys that want it and guys that don't. Yeah. And, and it's 100% in their control. And so for players, you need to make a decision. Are you going to, sit in front of, you know, the Xbox for an hour, or is that an hour that could have been used to do football in a different way? And, and maybe that's going on YouTube and it's watching, you know, really top level games and looking at tactical applications of some top teams. And unlike, you know, maybe sometimes where you watch the game as a fan and you're just enjoying tracking the ball and the movement, this time an opportunity can be to, you know, look specifically at, I play right back and now I'm looking specifically at the right back in this team. When is he narrow? When is he wide? 
What kind of backing out and spacing is he having to be able to find passing channels going forward? When does he join the attack? When does he support the player in advance? All of these things can be looked at, you know, beyond the technical quality, but those are all tactical learning opportunities that can be really easily done by looking at games where you can see a tactical view and see most of the players on the screen at the same time right. and ha have this be a real psychological and tactical learning perspective time. Yeah. That, that kind of led into a second question that I had. Um, you know, you're talking about tactics. It was, you know, do you have any recommendations for players to stay active on either the mental or tactical side of the game? Sure. And, you know, in, in particular, you know, should they be, going on and watching some of these webinars that, you know, people are putting on about tactical parts of the game. Should they be watching YouTube? Um, you know, and like you said, you know, stop it, look, you know, see, is there, is there anything mentally or tactically, you know, that specifically you could tell them, you know, obviously. Yeah. Some well, I mean, you and I both know players are so fortunate these days because, you know, when we're not in, you know, coronavirus time, they can, they can watch soccer on TV and live pretty much 24 hours a day. Whereas you and I growing up, you got one day a week on a Thursday from England that got played five days earlier and you, you didn't know it wasn't live because there was no internet. Right. And so, you know, the world has changed and, it, and it's great. And so the opportunity right now for, for players to be able to go on YouTube and search teams and search games and search players and be able to watch players in specific positions and yeah, there are, there are plenty of things out there. Um, and, and I've watched a number of them over this break where there's been a little bit more time to be able to go, you know, watch somebody's tactical orientations or look at something that's a little bit unique to somebody's playing structure. I think it's, it's fun to be able to go and do those things. And I think players should take advantage of these opportunities that there's some time that they ordinarily may not have because you know, stay at home orders or keeping you in a situation where you're a little bit more limited. Um, and I would think that, you know, taking advantage of that for an hour a day can really at least drive some questions for your coach as a player. Um, you know, Hey, listen, I was watching, if we're just talking about right backs again, I was watching Trent Alexander Arnold and looking at, you know, the amount that he goes forward. Um, and I was looking at the moments that he goes forward based on who has the ball in the field and how the ball is moving. Look, I mean, it, it's just picking an example because I was talking about right backs and that's a in form, you know, in fab right back right now. But there's lots of ways to be able to, I think, be able to take advantage of this and, and look and, and generate questions and have a dialogue with your coach tactically about growing during this period of time on yeah. that front. Well, and it's funny because one of the things that, that we've put out to a lot of our players um, is go out and watch the documentaries. Yeah. And I can't, I can't tell you how much I've actually learned. You know, I grew up in a, in a weird period, you know, the game when, you know, I got to watch Beckenbauer and Pele and, and guys like that, but to go back even farther and see some of the documentaries and the history and, you know, with Cruyff at Barcelona, how he turned that into tactical situations and what Holland was doing and, you know, you start to see all these different players and different aspects of their game. You learn so much more about other players as well and what their input was and how the game has tactically changed. So, um, you know, I encourage kids to go watch those as well, you know, and learn the, I think of the game. For sure. Those are great. And there's so many good books that you can, I mean, I just read Chris book and, and I mean, the, the, there's so many good books that you can read that give you a historical perspective um, and appreciation and, you know, I mean, you talk about watching some games. I was watching a game the other day from the 90 World Cup. And, you know, it, it reminds you that up until 92, you, you could pass the ball back to the goalkeeper and they could pick it up. Right. Um, and, and there's probably a lot of players that don't have that sort of <laughs> you know, recognition that, wait, you could do that? Right. I mean, the, the first time I showed a college team uh, clips from that era, they were like, wait, 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 what just happened? <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, but there's been an evolution in the game, just like, the, you know, the evolving, you know, being able to play goal kicks from inside the area. And, and so the game is constantly evolving. The tempo is constantly going up. You look at 90 or 94 World Cup, and the pace of the game is significantly slower than it is now. Um, you know, the tempo, the pace, the technical premium, the tactical nuance, I mean, all of these things are evolutions in the game. But – 
you know, players have to be able to do these things faster than they ever had to before and at a higher action frequency during the course of a match because of the tempo. Right. And, you know, being able to understand those things and learn during this period of time can be an opportunity uh, to grow. Good. So let me, let me go into another question. It kind of changed almost the direction, but, but a little bit. How do you think uh, COVID-19 has impacted the landscape right now of recruitment? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, there were this spring, there were a number of tournaments that didn't happen. There were league seasons that didn't occur. And so from a recruiting standpoint in general, you know, there were opportunities that didn't happen that, you know, means that players maybe weren't evaluated in the same way that they would have been ordinarily. Now, obviously, with the NCAA contact rules, you know, for college coaches, we're really not as a broad scope players aren't being recruited before their junior year in any case. And, and in most cases, players are making commitments during their senior year. And in a lot of cases, it's halfway through or later. Um, and having been at the NAI level, having been at the Division II level, having been at smaller Division I schools, I mean, recruiting was during the senior year. And so um, I think in some ways, yeah, there's been, there's been some events missed and there's been, you know, some things that have changed. But I think going forward for, you know, guys in the 21 class, guys in, in the, the, the class of 2022, you know, they're, they're, there's probably not that much effect. If anything, you know, they're, like we mentioned earlier, they're getting this window to do some focus, focusing on themselves individually and working and growing. Um, you know, for, for guys in the 2021 class, maybe there had started to been some communication with regards to college coaches during the junior year. You know, it, you'll just have to be really prioritizing that communication with coaches going into the senior year, looking at hopefully events that come off this summer, um, late late in the summertime, or as we get to the fall, um, looking at events that you can, you know, communicate and contact coaches about being seen at. Right. Yeah, one of the, one of the things is, and, I, you know, I'm not, not actually expecting an answer, but one of the things we're telling our players is this is a good time you know, because college coaches are essentially doing the same thing we are. They're at home. They're, you know, having to watch film or answer emails or, or Zoom calls with all their teams and blah, blah, you know, specifically. And, I'm, you know, we're telling them, get a little highlight reel. Get an introduction letter to them right now because it's a good time just to at least get introduced to them, right? Sure. And so, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the direction we've taken with our players at least. You know, get, get your name out there. Yeah, and I think it makes some sense. Um... You know, I don't know that for most college coaches, we're significantly less busy outside of not training our teams, but still communicating with our players individually takes time and, and handling all the normal business takes time. Now we're not on the road recruiting, but we're probably watching video and, you know, most college coaches receive a lot of email interest in videos. And so they take the time to watch a couple minutes. Um, and typically you don't want and you know, I think most coaches would tell you, you don't want a, a highlight video that's 27 minutes long because it's not, that's not going to get watched. And, and I think most coaches would say a couple minute highlight reel to get a flavor and a sense of who you are as a player in preparation for, you know, putting the hook in to, to try to see you play. And then, you know, be prepared to have hopefully a high level game that you can follow up with if the coach requests being able to see you play. Now, again, they, they can't, College coaches can't contact anybody who's going, who's a sophomore currently yet, so they can't send a response. Um, but if you so if you send a highlight link and then also have here's a full match where I played, here's the position I'm playing in, um, in what number and in the team, it gives the coach the flexibility of being able to look at in very short order a lot of repetitions of your performances. And, and my recommendation, and I think most college coaches' recommendation typically is you know, have that come from one or two games. Now, maybe if you're a goal scorer, you can put all 24 goals you scored this year. But, you know, outside of that, having a lot of repetition from one particular game makes it like the coach came to see you play. And it means that it's not just, hey, I had one good action in this game. I had one good action in this game. I had one good action in this game. A lot of repetition and act good actions in, in a particular game show a level of consistency and quality. And 
I think for sure working on putting that together is a good time to do that. And, and then also maybe including the entirety of a match. So if somebody wants to watch all of your actions and all the lead up to, you know, how they transpired, I think those can be really useful things. Okay, good. No, I, I appreciate that. And I think, all, I think all the kids will appreciate that as well. Um, you know, I could just want to touch on this a little bit and, and we kind of did in those answers, but you know, with the cancellation of all these tournaments and the showcases and sending out video in general, how do you think the college coaches are actually adjusting to all this? Are they adjusting or is it kind of, you know, they're just moving along with their business? I think there will have to be some adjustment. Uh, I think certainly for college coaches who would have been recruiting during this period of time, which is pretty much everybody, um, you know, we, there's been a loss in sort of a window of recruiting time through the spring and probably part of the summer. And so that's just going to probably put a greater emphasis on recruiting in the fall, um, which is for college coaches is a fairly challenging time because the season's going on. Um, but there probably will be some adjustment with watching more video or having to go to a couple of additional events uh, that you might not have to otherwise. But, it, but it, it also may not change things. I, I don't know. It may just mean that the, the recruiting cycle for the next year or two ends up running a little bit later um, than it would have otherwise. Players may end up getting, you know, making commitments later on than they were um, maybe in previous years. Now they are in a situation where, you know, instead of, you know, the interest happening September, October and making a verbal commitment in November – now it's happening November, December, making a verbal commitment in the new year, February, February. Again, it's hard, it's impossible to predict, but I would assume that those would be some of the outcomes of a three or four month sort of delay in recruiting cycle. Okay. So one of the things you touched on a, a little while ago, and, and I kind of, we asked a couple other questions. I want to go back a little bit and say, you know, can you explain what a dead period is um, for the NCAA? Um, and they instituted it during the COVID break, right? As far as I know, there's some, there's some dates. And what does the dead period um, entail so that kids understand? Sure. I mean, I, the, the nice thing about soccer is that we really, in general, don't have dead periods with exception of around signing day in November, uh, which is a 48-hour period where you, you, dead period means you can't have off-campus interaction whether that's going and evaluating, whether it's contacting people and you can't have people come visit campus. You can still make phone calls. You can still email um, the prospective student athletes who are at age to be able to have those things occur, but we can't do the other things that I mentioned. Um, when essentially the shutdown happened um, with COVID-19, the NCAA essentially put in about a one month dead period. So they, anybody who was out on the road recruiting was recalled. Um, anybody who was planning on going on the road um, had to cancel their plans. And essentially, there was no off-campus recruiting. There were no off-campus contacts. And no prospective student athlete was allowed to take a visit to campuses during that month period. And that, that mandated month ended um, on the 15th of April. And, and so that, that dead period has, has ended. But... In most cases, there still aren't leagues going, so there's not leagues to go watch. Um, there's, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're trying to go to Europe to watch players or obviously in, in America, you, there's nobody to go watch because leagues aren't participating. Right. And they're also, you know, there was not the ability to have players come and visit campuses because campuses are closed at this point. Um, I think, I mean, I can't speak for every university in America, but I think pretty much everybody's on an online platform and yeah. universities wanted that for the, for the spring semester or quarter. And so, you know, that dead period really was just put in place to equalize and standardize recruiting practices. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it made sense. Uh, and I think that it, uh, it certainly fell in line with the fact that there were not a lot of recruiting possibilities and certainly from a health and safety standpoint, it didn't make a lot of sense. You know, if, I, if coaches are trying to get somebody to come visit, um, you know, that, that wasn't any, any good with regards to trying to bring somebody in and spend time with them individually on campus campsite. So okay. I think just conversations had to be had. Yeah. And then um, 
just for clarification for everybody out there, because I've told everybody, but June 15th between your sophomore and junior year is typically when a college coach can now communicate, correct, with uh, potential, correct. potential athletes? Yeah, at the Division One level, uh, for sure. I think Division Two is the same, although I, it's been a couple of years for me from being in Division Two. I'd have to go back and check my, my NCAA manual on, on that one. Um, I think Division Three and NAI no contact restrictions, so that doesn't affect them. But it, but at Division One for sure, it's June fifteenth um, after the sophomore year is when correspondence okay. and contact. And, and is that the one day they can contact once a week? Correct. Uh, the, the the there's not a weekly restriction anymore. Okay. And so um, that, that's been that's been freed up. And that's via phone call, text message, email as well. All yep, exactly. Okay. okay. So all, all of that, and it's the point at which you can, you can on camp. Well, wait, wait, that's the contact on campus visits. See, these things always get confusing because you only think about them once a year. Um, the on campus, the on campus visit doesn't happen until later in the summertime. Though. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's August 1st is, is yeah. the date that I've seen. Yeah. No, it, it, yeah. It's kind of funny because back when, you know, I was coaching a text message was an absolute no, no. No, oh, yeah, you couldn't do that. And, and nowadays you can do it. And it's <laughs> well, they're trying to, pro- trying to protect American football players from, you know, American football coaches just blowing their text up because, hey, right. you had to pay per tax that was coming into your phone and you didn't want people's bills going up. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, w- with, uh, with the change in technology, uh, those things have changed. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what they do, uh, you know, like with Twitter and Instagram and all that kind of stuff and messages these coaches are sending sometimes. And, you know, is there anything hidden, you know, behind it? So um, I-, I hope it doesn't go that way. I, you know, I hope it just continues to stay with the simple communication. Yeah. And I, th- I think most coaches – in general, like I said earlier, the, re- the recruiting process in 99.9% of the cases, I think across the board, aren't really happening before these dates anyway. And I think right. that w- that's why they tried to make these adjustments to having soccer recruiting correspondence really start to happen after the sophomore year. And so right. I think in a lot of cases, you know, because of the freedom that we now have in communication after that date, you know, there, there doesn't have to be a whole lot. And anybody who's doing it beforehand, you know, they're trying to bypass rules, which isn't cool. Right. Um, I know we talked about this question. I'm, I'm going to ask it. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a short answer. But um, what, what is, if any, are some of the NCAA rules or advantages that the 2021 player might have as compared to, like, the 20, say, 22 or 2020s at this, at this period? Sure. Um, really, the only thing that occurred was with regards to the 2020 grads. Um, if, if they had, for some reason, not taken an SAT yet uh, in preparation for college and the SAT tested or the ACT was canceled, um, you know, the NCAA is going to, I believe, make some allowances for players to, you know, look at eligibility without that test. Really, that's the only change. For 2021s, for 2022s, there's, there's really not a, a change, an advantage, a disadvantage. Uh, Everything is going to be, at this point, fairly normal and consistent to the way it was before. Obviously, the only difference for the 21s is that the recruiting cycle, you know, had a little bit, has had a little bit of a hiccup in evaluation over the course of two months. Okay, cool. Well, I've got one last question. Okay. And I will, you know, again, appreciate your time. In general, um, what advice would you provide to a club soccer player that's aspiring to play in college these days? Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple. Um, I think certainly the first is a lot of it is in your control, and it's how much do you want to work and do that work, and how much do you want to take advantage of the resources around you, the coaches that can give you feedback. Um, but we talked earlier, it mostly falls squarely in, in the individual's court. You know, how much work are they willing to put in? How much work do they want to put towards their own personal development and growth? The second thing is in the recruiting process, it, it, it's not going to magically happen in most cases that, you know, you're going to get seen and recruited and, and wow, it's going to be fantastic in that way. It takes work. Um, it takes self-promotion. It takes um, being intelligent about who you are individually and 
what the collegiate environment that would be the best fit for you um, is going to be. And, and so, you know, how close to home? Um, what size school? What are the academic parameters of the school that you can get into based on your grades or that line up with what you're interested in majoring in? If you want to be an engineer in the school, your schools you're looking at done engineering, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and so you've got to sort of factor these things. What is the cost of the particular schools that you're looking at? What is your family's financial situation and how do those things mesh together? And so I think as you look at all these different factors, it's important as students to start to make a list and narrow that list down to how the university fit part is going to be good. Now, when we add the soccer side of things, now we can start to look at, you know, different levels of soccer. What kind of player am I? What level should I be playing at? What level should I be aspiring to play at? And this is where getting good confirmation and, and information from both the coach and prospectively the technical directors at clubs um, about, hey, you're a good player. We think that you should be aiming at this level of playing in America. And this type of collegiate standard would be a good fit for you. And then so now you're starting to cross-reference the recommended level to be trying to reach out to coaches and the schools that you're interested in that fit some of the criteria that I mentioned before. And now you start to get a list of schools that's pretty reasonable. And I think from there, you start to narrow down the schools that you should be planning on visiting. You start to narrow down the schools that you should be planning on contacting to try to come see you play. Uh, and I think when those things happen, each individual gets closer and closer to finding the university and the collegiate playing and academic fit that's going to be the best for them and for their family. And when those things happen, it's a really wonderful experience. Everybody wants to go play Division One soccer because hey, I'm going to play Division One soccer. And having been at smaller divisions or technically smaller divisions, the experience that you can have playing at an NAI or a Division Three or a Division Two level, it can be every bit as good as being at the Division One level. Um, there may be some schools that you've never heard of that can be a great fit. And so the opportunity, um, especially during this time, to do some of this work and thinking and have conversations with coaches um, because trying to find the right fit is so critical to, to a wonderful experience. And you're talking to a guy who played at a small college level. Um, but my experience was fantastic. And as a result, you know, I wanted to go into college coaching because I enjoyed it. And, and so I think that's the case for most guys who played. Um, but I've sat in so many, you know, coaching, recruiting forums over the course of the last 20 years. And every single coach there said the same thing all the time. Find the fit that's going to be great for you. Because if you get an opportunity to play and you're in a place where financially it works for your family and there's an academic degree that's going to be great for you. All of those things are going to make your experience wonderful and they're going to let you maximize the opportunity on all fronts. And it probably you develop as a player the fastest you could. Um, you enjoy the playing part as much as you could. The degree you're going to get is going to fit you and you want to put yourself or your family in a financial constraints that maybe you couldn't handle. And so I just look at all those factors and I constantly want to use the word fit when I'm talking to the players because it, there's no point in trying to go find something that's not going to be a great fit, but it takes some self introspection it takes talking with parents because parents know um, the prospective student more than anybody else and can give some very good insight. And it takes talking to club coaches who've got a lot of experience and can give recommendations with regards to both level and university types um, to help make that connection a fit. Yeah. Well, and it's funny you bring that up because one of the things that I do in my presentations with the parents is I think there's two different lists, right? I think there's a player's list. You know, the four is they want to pick a school on soccer, social, um, cost, and location, right? Or, you know, somewhere in between there. And the parents are looking at probably cost, education, soccer, and social, right? So it's and, – and I think, you know, that's, that's where players have to talk with their parents as well and get a good feeling. Yep. Um, 
the follow-up question I have to what you were talking about was um, what do you think about players going out and watching these teams play? Because, you know, we talk about a good fit and players all think they want to play division one or they want to play at a certain location, but how do they really evaluate themselves compared to what the game they're watching? Is there, do you have any advice for that? Well, I think it's, it's great because most schools, I think at this point will have games online. Mm -hmm. Um, And so obviously Arizona doesn't have loads and loads of, you know, men's men's collegiate soccer programs. And so um, I think there certainly there are some in state that, that could be fantastic experiences. And, and one thing Arizona does have an advantage with is that the junior college level is really great. And so as a stepping stone, even for one year, um, it can, it can be a really great transitionary piece if you haven't found the right fit at a four-year university. I've digressed, but th- the reality is with four-year university, most schools will have, you know, games that are broadcast online and the ability to watch those or, you know, correspond with a coach and ask them to send you the link. Um, you know, these things are doable. But being able to get a sense of, you know, how a particular team plays, I mean, you know, I think, you know, in general, say you're a – not very tall, super technical central midfielder, and you're looking at a school and tactically their center backs never pass the ball to the central midfield. They constantly just ping it forward. Well, it might not be a great fit for that player individually. Um, and, and we could look at all sorts of different, you know, particularities with regards to, you know, personal strengths of players. Um, and how they might fit with a particular tactical scheme of a, a coaching staff. Uh, but I also think that, you know, one thing players should do and, and as they're in the recruiting process and meeting the collegiate coach and they're narrowing down the schools that they're looking at, it's really important for players to interview the coach. Uh, it's not just, you know, does the coach want you? It's important as fu- in finding the right fit on a, on a soccer side that the interviewing of the coach of, hey, tell me what you see in my game that's going to help me translate and be a success here. And I think the coach having to articulate what in the player's performances is attracting them to them, I think that translates to knowing, you know, how well does that coach see me? How well does that coach understand what I think I am as a player? How well are they articulating how they're planning on using me? And then additionally, hey, where am I going to fall in your roster? If you've got 30 guys on your roster. Am I being a freshman perspective being the first eleven the first player? Am I getting to turn that next year eleven through twenty that I probably get to play some um, and compete to play? Or am I in twenty one through thirty and really I'm here to develop and there's a potential that if I don't play I end up by default then red shirting um, because I didn't play my first year and I still retain the four years of eligibility. I think that those interviews and questions are really important. And I think those things are finding the right fit, but that takes, again, that's the homework part for, for students. And listen, bottom line, this is the biggest homework assignment you're going to have outside of trying to get good grades in every class you have, which is the most important thing because it keeps doors open. The next thing is as you're picking a school, especially if soccer is a factor is doing your research to find the right fit. Right. No, those are, those are great points, and I, I really hope uh, people are paying attention to that answer because I think he just hit it right on the on – the, um, I, I do have one last question, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, no problem. I'm not sure you can actually answer it, but I'm going to ask. Um, a lot of players that are not getting recruited, say they haven't – you know, the recruiting process has gone on, they've gotten looked at, but they're not really getting recruited, but they've picked a college. Are there chances still for them at the schools they're picking to have some sort of walk-on tryout? Yeah, it's going to depend case by case and school by school. Okay. Um, and, and so I think those are conversations directly with the coach. You know, different programs are going to all have different ways in which they go about looking at sort of the, the walk-on process. And, and I think there's a couple different layers to this. The first is – you know, a player who has had conversations with a coach and the coach is interested in them. There's not going to be a scholarship component. They're giving them, they're essentially a recruited walk on. Um, And that 
you know, if the coach is saying, hey, we want you to come here, you're going to be in the roster, they're going to articulate what your position is going to be in the team um, in that sort of quote unquote recruited walk on position. Yeah. And, and I think, but that again is a really direct communication with the coach about where do they see you, what is your position, and what is your standing with the group. And is that position guaranteed in the first fall? Or, or are you going and are you still having to try out in the first couple of days of training camp? Because schools are allowed to have this tryout process right. um, where you know, they, they can put players through that opportunity but then make a decision not to keep them. Well, that could influence somebody's decision on attending a school if they don't. Oh, there's some risk. I might not make the team. What does my collegiate experience look like if I, if soccer's not part of it? How does that change my view? The other side of it is just I've picked the school that I want to go to. It's a great fit for me on all the academic, social, cost fronts. It's it's where I want to go. The, and you know maybe the coach says, hey, we'll give you an opportunity to walk on. Some coaches will. Some coaches won't. Um, and we're going to, but we're going to give you the opportunity to walk on again. The question is, is walk on. Does that mean I get the first two weeks in training camp? Does that mean I get the first three days in a tryout period? Does that mean I, I get the entire fall of the first year? You more than anything, you just want clarity and confirmation as to what it looks like. So there's no surprises. Right. No, I agree. I, and part, part of the reason why I asked that question is because I don't want players to give up hope on, you know, being able to play cause there's, there's a level for everybody. They just have to kind of figure out which is the right level. But I also don't want kids to give up on a dream if they want to play in college and at least have a good college experience. You know, and that's kind well, of, and, and look, you know, go ahead. No, go ahead. You're good. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I was just going to say a lot of times somebody really wants a big school and it may not, they may not have the capacity to play at that level. And as a result, there's going to be a club team for them to, to play and you know, it's going to, it's going to be different, but they're going to, you know, they're going to train a couple days a week. They're going to still get games throughout the fall in, in a club environment. Um, but if it's the competitive environment, it, it's really working on, you want that as part of your experience. It's constantly working to find, and, and I can't stress use coaches in your club as resources enough to, to try to give guidance with regards to the level that you should be shooting for in communication with coaches that you should be looking at. And, and there's a big range. There's a big range in division one. There's a big range in division two. There's a big range in, in the NAI. There's a big range in division three. Top schools can compete against each other in, across the divisions, but there's also schools that aren't as successful and the standard and level is completely different. And so having conversations with coaches and having conversations with the coaches at the schools that you're looking for. Do you see me being able to play here? Getting as much information as you can is critical to finding that fit. Right. Awesome. Well, I think I've taken enough of your time and, and, and I'm sure we could sit here and talk soccer all day long. And I really appreciate it. Um, again, we're talking, uh, we're finishing up with Ryan Jordan, head coach of UCLA men's soccer. Um, we, we appreciate your time and best of luck to you in, in the coming fall uh, and hopefully things uh, move forward for everybody. Yeah, we're just we're hopeful that we can return to some normalcy um, across the NCAA landscape. Um, and we're hoping that happens during the summertime here so that we can get back on sort of normal academic cycles. So do we. So do we. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So thanks again, Ryan.